morning again. I hope everyone is enjoying this day of getting to know our community of literary publishers a little bit better. Um, at this time, I have the distinct honor of introducing today's keynote speaker to you. 31 and a half years ago this week, I attended a poetry reading in an auditorium not unlike this one at a small liberal arts college in New England, given by a poet who was there reading from his first book of poems. I was a senior in college, and my poetry professor and mentor, Mary Jo Salter, made it clear that I needed to go to hear this poet read. Afterwards, she introduced me to him, and I can remember quite clearly shaking his hand and saying how much I had enjoyed his work, standing in the midst of the emptying chairs of the auditorium. I was 21 years old and pretty overwhelmed by the idea of shaking the hand of a professional publishing writer, which was everything I someday wanted to be. That poet was Dana Joya, the Dana Joya before Can Poetry Matter, before the chairmanship of the NEA, before the State Poetry Laureateship, before the prizes and the best-selling anthologies and the endowed chairs. The date was April 23rd, 1988. And you might wonder at my ability to remember that, apart from the fact that it also happens to be Shakespeare's birthday. The date of this reading isn't recorded anywhere on the internet, I looked, um, because of course there was no internet yet. I know the date I met the poet on the stage here next to me because he signed my book. Here it is. And in a little while, I'll ask him to sign it again, if for no other reason than to take note of the way time on this title page will seem to take up so little space. And yet, and yet we are not the same people we were then in that other auditorium. It is this book, these words, that connect us to that time a third of a century ago and to that space on the other side of the country. In a little while, I'll introduce this poet to some of my students who are here today in this auditorium. In fact, it already happened just a few minutes ago outside. And so it goes on. Because words matter, because poetry does in fact matter, because I can hold a book in my hands 31 and a half years later, and it amounts to something more even than the sum of its parts. It's publishing that allows for that magic to happen. Publishing matters. Our poet, Dana Joya, has written the following in a poem ostensibly about the passage of time, but which I also think can apply to this work of publishing, insofar as it provides the means for the writer's words to endure. This is a section from his poem called On Approaching Forty. The years rise like a swarm around my shoulders. Nothing has been in vain. This is the work which all complete together and alone, the living and the dead, to penetrate the impenetrable world down open roads, down mine shafts of discovery and loss, and learned from many loves, or only one, from father down to son, till all is clear. In the ensuing 31 and a half years since he signed my book, our keynote speaker became one of the preeminent writers and thinkers working in the country today. He had a notable career in business as a vice president of General Foods Corporation. And then from 2003 to 2009, Joya served as chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts, where he helped create and launch the largest programs in the agency's history, including Poetry Out Loud, The Big Read, 
Shakespeare in American Communities, and Operation Homecoming, Writing the Wartime Experience. In Washington, Joya created a bipartisan majority in Congress to raise the NEA budget each year of his chairmanship. In fact, Business Week has called him in an article, quote, the man who saved the NEA. He has more recently, from 2015 to 2019, served as the California State Poet Laureate, visiting all 58 counties in the state during his tenure. Joy has published five full-length collections of poetry, most recently 99 Poems, New and Selected in 2016, which won the Poets' Prize as the best new book of that year. His third collection, Interrogations at Noon, which was published in 2001, was awarded the American Book Award. He is also a highly regarded critic with four books of essays, as well as two dozen best-selling literary anthologies, one which I used to use uh, to teach my classes. His controversial volume, Can Poetry Matter, which was published in 1992, was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award. Joya is a native son of Los Angeles with roots in the Italian and Mexican communities and was the first in his family to attend college, taking degrees at Stanford and Harvard universities. Currently, he serves on the faculty at the University of Southern California during the fall semesters, where he holds the Judge Whitney Chair of Poetry and Public Culture. We're honored to have him speaking to us today on the topic of the future of literary Los Angeles. Please help me welcome Dana Joya to the podium. Good morning. I uh, get a lot of invitations to speak, and uh, as I get older, uh, by golly, I'm getting older. Um, I take fewer and fewer of these, but when Linda Dove asked me to speak at this conference, once she explained to me what she had in mind, I immediately accepted. Uh, and so I want to begin my talk by offering congratulations twice to you. First of all, I want to congratulate you for being here today. And by, at the very end of the talk, I'll tell you why I, I want to congratulate you in that respect. But I also want to congratulate you on your wisdom, your planning, or your, what my mother used to call shithouse luck, for being in Los Angeles uh, as a young you know, uh, or, or established or aspiring writer, editor, or publisher. Because a lot of success depends on being in the right place at the right time. And although probably most of you don't think so, you are, through planning or through luck or both, in the right place at the right time uh, in literary Los Angeles. Now, I want to cover a lot of material, so I'm going to, I've made some, just some lists of, of things here that I, to keep me from to being able to do it quickly rather than a kind of meandering way. But let me just start by saying Los Angeles right now is the most vital, the most inclusive, the most innovative, and also the most misunderstood literary capital in the world. Now, I don't know, if I ask you what your impression is of sort of the arts in Shanghai, or you know, I ask you about Paris, you know, you may be able to offer an opinion, but you probably say, well, you know, Paris is Paris, you know, it's always been a great center, or Shanghai seems to be growing. Uh, most people don't have much of an opinion, but I guarantee you, you go anywhere in the world and you ask a writer or an arts person about Los Angeles, and they have an opinion. Uh, now, the most uh, confused and benighted opinions come from a, a city called New York. Uh, <laughs> which, I don't know if you heard of it, sort of on the eastern side of this continent. And uh, what I, wanted, I put together was a series of statements about Los Angeles with some quotes about here's one of the perceptions of a city which one New Yorker had said where the only cultural advantage is being able to make a right turn on red. Uh, that's Woody Allen. Uh, 
Here, here, are the, here are the preconceptions that, as Angelinos, we deal with, especially from New Yorkers, but you know, from other people, is that one, Los Angeles isn't really a city, just a sprawling suburb uh, you know, connected by freeways. Uh, you, know, you know all the cliches. It has no downtown. There's no there there. Uh, H.L. Mencken said many years ago, the town is inconceivably shoddy, 19 suburbs in search of a metropolis. Two, L.A. is a city of transients. No one was born here. People come to L.A. to pursue their dreams. Nobody feels a sense of belonging. Everything is new and nothing is built to, to last. There's no local character except the delusional expectations of sunshine, wealth, and stardom. Um, you know, third, you know, L.A. is shallow and inauthentic. All surface, no depth. Surfers and starlets gliding over the surface of life. These are actual quotes. Uh, like a Hollywood set, a bright facade with nothing behind the surface. Uh, two symbols of L.A. are Disneyland and Hollywood. Uh, my favorite is actually, uh, it's unfair, but I think at least it's funny. It's the old radio comedian Fred Allen said, it's a great place to live if you're an orange. Uh, you know, four, Los Angeles is the center of bland, suburban, consumerist culture. The worst materialism combined with credulous fatism. Uh, what passes for culture is driven by food and novelty. Uh, yoga, transcendental med meditation, vegetarianism. Uh, uh, as a forgotten journalist of the 1930s described the City of Angels, a big, sprawling, incoherent, shapeless, slobbering, civic idiot in the family of American communities. Uh, five, Los Angeles has no artistic culture except showbiz, no intellectual life. No art, only entertainment as a commodity. Uh, commercial Hollywood has devoured all of the other arts. Everything is show and surface. Uh, or as F. Scott Fitzgerald said about Hollywood, it's a mining town in Lotus Land. Uh, now, I will you know, address these things, but I want to say that the interesting thing about it is that most of those quotes were made by people who don't live here. Uh, it was made by actually you know, the transients, uh, you know, who uh, by describing themselves saw a city of transients. I am a native Angelino. Uh, Mexican side of my family has been here for 110 years. Uh, even the Sicilian side of my family has been in Los Angeles for 90 years. Uh, you know, how many people in this uh, in this uh, room are, were born in Southern California? Gee, it's the majority of us. Uh, you know, and so you have this sense of people who glide into Hollywood and glide out of Hollywood, uh, typifying it. What we are in right now is the moment in which Los Angeles is finally defining itself uh, versus the rest of the world. That's why a, a gathering like today is so important because it gives us a chance actually, you know, uh, with our own eyes and ears to do an assessment of what we see here. Now, uh, Los Angeles is a, is a strange city historically. If you think about this, in 1900, the population here was 102,000 people. Uh, right now, in the city of Los Angeles, there's 3.8 million people. In the county of Los Angeles, there's 10 million people. And in what we think of the Southland is, you know, basically 18 million souls. Yes, Angelinos have souls. Uh, you know, which makes us, you know, really one of the two largest metro areas in North America. Now. Uh, Angelinos, and this is something I think that uh, some other places find deeply disturbing. Angelinos come from everywhere. If you look at uh, the very founding of Los Angeles, and most Angelinos don't know about when Los Angeles was, was created, uh, there was a group of people uh, which were from the very beginning mixed race. It was uh, Indians, Mestizos, uh, Africans, a few Europeans, uh, and the Europeans were at the very beginning in the minority. And it was created really as a multiracial, uh, you know, a multilingual city in 1771. Now, 
Los Angeles was initially uh, a Hispanic city. Then briefly, in about 1920s, 1930s, it became primarily an Anglo city. Uh, it's now uh, you know, basically become a city in which no group has a majority. It's about you know, one third European, one third uh, Latin America, and one third everything else. Uh, I expect that by the middle of this century, most Angelinos are gonna be like me. They're gonna be mixed race. You know, in my family, uh, you know, which, was, which was a Mexican and a Sicilian marrying, uh, my brother married uh, a, a woman whose, whose heritage is Islamic Indian. My, bro my brother is married to a Korean. My sister, who has very little imagination, which is why she's in the Navy, uh, married another person who was Italian and Mexican. <laughs> and I'm married to uh, a woman you know, who is German and Russian Jewish. That, I think, is the future of Los Angeles. It is essentially, a, it is the future. It is the future where we are humans who have links to tribes, but are not confined by those tribes. That's something which I think determines the particular energy in this town. And it's also what people outside of it have a very complicated uh, way of describing. Now, if you think about Los Angeles, then, well, what are some of the, of the, of the observations you would make? It, the, the, here is the, the thing is, what is Los Angeles today? It is the city which has the most artists of anywhere in the Western Hemisphere. I think, arguably, although I don't have the data for this, it probably has the most artists of any city in the world. We uh, passed New York up about uh, 15 years ago. Uh, we have somewhere over 150,000 people in Los Angeles whose primary occupation is in the arts. That gives us a kind of critical mass, which has probably never existed anywhere before in history. Secondly, it is the city, and this is, you know, for us as literary people, which is now tied with New York as the largest book market uh, in North America. Third, uh, it is the largest, and we all know this, center of electronic entertainment and media. It's the home of TV, movies, radio, recordings, uh, video games, and it's you know, where, probably along with Santa Clara Valley, most of the new electronic media are emerging. It is the cultural center of the Pacific Rim. It's the connecting point between, uh, you could say North America, but you could even say North America and Europe with Latin America and with Asia. Uh, if, you, if you contrast that position to New York, you can think of it almost metaphorically. New York is facing to the American past in Europe. Los Angeles is facing to the American future in Latin America and the Pacific Rim. Now, this is not to say that what New York's cultural heritage isn't fantastically rich and valuable. But I think, uh, curiously, if you think of, of the amount of, of resources it takes, in a sense, to curate <clears throat> organizations, the budget that it just takes to run this university, the budget it takes to run a symphony, a, a, a museum, uh, most of New York's resources in the future will be used simply to curate what already exists in Los Angeles, we're building the future around us. Uh, I made a list of the play of 25 years ago. You know, I, I've been in New York. I came back to California, and then I went off to Washington. You know, uh, you know. Again, this is a very, very partial list of the organizations in Los Angeles which did not exist. 25 years ago, and I obviously can make the list three times as long. The LA Opera, the Getty Center, the Broad Museum, LA MOCA, the Los Angeles Ballet, the Los Angeles Shakespeare Festival, the Broad Stage, the Los Angeles Dance Festival, the Los Angeles Times Festival of Books, the Skirball uh, Cultural Center, Los Angeles Poetry Festival, the Museum of Latin American Art, Red Hen Press, LA Review of Books, uh, and more film festivals than you could possibly even list what is happening is Los Angeles is growing up around us. It's pulling the, the, uh, the human capital, the, uh, 
financial capital, the cultural capital together to create what we need. Uh, let me see if we can do this in a very simple way. LA has more artists than anywhere in the world. It is perfectly positioned in a sense technologically, culturally, geographically, demographically, in a sense to grasp the future probably better than any other cultural center. What we did not have and what we are creating is the infrastructure of culture. The magazines, the presses, uh, the websites, the bookstores, the cultural centers, the reading series, the stages, the concerts, the foundations, uh, the trained personnel. I mean, it's interesting, Kate Gale, Red Hand Press is here. Kate is a perfect example of the, of the Los Angeles cultural leader. She's an autodidact. She, sim she and her husband made it up as they went along. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, in a sense, uh, she had she developed expertise because there was no other experts, uh, and you know, and has a kind of pragmatic knowledge. That's a very Los Angeles kind of arts biography. So we're in this uh, in interesting moment of our time where it's happened. There, you know, there's a, a, a phenomenon in physics where it's called critical mass. You take some kind of unstable, you just say radioactive material, and you apply pressure, and you apply pressure, and you apply pressure uh, onto it. And then when it hits a kind of critical mass, it begins to generate more energy than you've put into it. I think this is now where we are in Los Angeles. And, and it's, even in the last five years, uh, anywhere you, once again, you go in the world, people understand that LA uh, has become, in a sense, the avant-garde. And I don't mean this in a stylistic way, but in, in a kind of cultural way, the avant-garde of, of, of the West. Uh, now, I wonder, I, uh, I wanted to give you an old joke, uh, uh, which is, uh, in Washington, you would have heard this joke, and you'll know why uh, people in Washington laugh at it. It's, sort of, it's kind of complicated, so I wrote down. Now, you hear this joke all the time in Washington, D.C., uh, and they laugh at the final punchline, which is about Los Angeles, but I think an Angelino hears it differently now. Here's the joke. The Wall Street Journal is read by the people who run it country. The Washington Post is read by the people who think they run the country. The New York Times is read by the people who want to run the country. The Boston Globe is read by people whose grandparents used to run the country. They did a very good job, thank you. The San Francisco Chronicle is read by people who are not sure there is a country or who runs it. And the Los Angeles Times is run by the people who would run the country if they didn't have to leave Southern California. <laughs> now, in Washington, that just says that's how unserious Angelinos are. But in Los Angeles, we realize you're smart not to leave California. That there's, there are things happening here. There's a, being here opens up things that doesn't, uh, don't occur so easily hmm. elsewhere. So if you wanted to typify what Los Angeles was, you know, what it is becoming, it's, first of all, Los Angeles is a creative city, not a critical city. I mean, Boston has more universities probably than LA, you know, and colleges than LA will ever have. It has more scholars than LA will ever have. But, uh, and New York will probably, even at the end of this next century, still be the adjudicator of proper artistic taste because you've got all the presses and the magazines and critics residing there. Uh, we will never have as many dance reviews, opera critics, fiction editors, visual arts writers, or prize committees as New York City. Uh, uh, LA barely supports a handful of critics right now, only a couple of critical journals right now. What Los Angeles does is create the art that the rest of the world loves. Uh, and Virtually everyone in the world recognizes that. And it's not just the movies, it's music. And even if you think of certain writers who, in a sense, have jumped, who were 
unacceptable writers by New York standards. They could be Ray Bradbury. They could be Charles Bukowski. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, they could be Raymond Chandler. Those sort of new literary genres were created in Los Angeles. Secondly, LA is an international city. It looks outward and it looks abroad rather than looking back east. This infuriates New York and Boston. You know, how can you possibly spend more time looking at Asia than you do at us? It hurts their feelings. Uh, and it is a world center. It is not a subsidiary of New York or Washington. Third, LA is a new city. And this has good things as well as bad things. It is less concerned with the past and it is utterly drunkenly fascinated by the future. Los Angeles has not only invented new arts and industries, it has reinvented itself as a postmodern city, not simply for architecture and city planning, but for arts and culture. For LA is a growing city. It exists in a perpetual state of reorganization. Everything is open to change. Rebuilding is characteristic of all cities, but few do it as habitually as Los Angeles. Uh, now, this tendency shows a kind of horrifying disregard for the past. You know, about a week after Ray Bradbury died, bulldozers came and tore his house down because somebody had bought it to, you know, the, the lot to uh, build a mini, mini mansion. But it also reflects a kind of natural optimism that exists here for the future. LA is a populist city, and this is probably the key uh, cultural a dynamic that we've unleashed. Los Angeles was really the, the first modern uh, cultural center to say that there was no difference between high and popular culture, and to merge those things together when they were being so strictly enforced in Paris and London, in New York, and university cities like Boston. Uh, this is a city that emerges more characteristically from the bottom up than the top down. That creates confusion uh, but also makes it innovative, democratic, and, uh, and communal. Now, what do Ray Bradbury, Charles Bukowski, and Raymond Chandler have in common? They never went to college. You know, this is, in a sense, that these are populist people. Or, you know, they, uh, and so you know, it's, it's coming you know, from a, a culture which absorbs things in non-traditional ways. Next, LA is a contradictory city. It is both secular and religious, materialistic and spiritual, traditional and avant-garde, uh, with banks and churches, yoga studios, liquor stores, restaurants, and weight loss centers sitting on the same block. Uh, LA is a decentralized city. It lacks central planning at all levels. And this, too, is because it's emerging from the bottom up. Uh, it creates confusion, but it becomes an innovative, democratic, and mobile city. And finally, LA is the model for other futural cultural capitals. The town is so disorganized, anarchic, and open that it isn't an intimidating model for other cities, uh, for other growing cities to emulate. Uh, and, it, and with this strange kind of mobile, you know, constantly changing uh, physical culture is created here, is a dense, creative, inclusive, mobile, and mercurial cultural capital. Uh, LA you know, basically offers the best of European, Latin American, Native American, African American, Asian, uh, and international culture in which everything from Hollywood to the Vatican, you know, Buddha to the Beach Boys, you know, can, fi can find a place. Uh, the, and this really brings me to the point that I wanted to end up, because uh, I wanted to stay on time, which I think is always a positive thing at a, at a conference with a lot of speakers. And this is the thing that I, the three things I want you to, to think about. First is that LA's cultural, uh, what you call it? Not just cultural energy, LA's uh, cultural scene is growing faster than anywhere else in North America. Secondly, uh, we're never going to surpass New York because we're not comparable to New York. We are turning into something, and this is why we're important, 
which has never existed before in the history of human culture. Uh, we are already larger in human terms than the art scene in New York. New York will remain this unparalleled conservator of past culture, but what LA is, is a kind of un explorer going into the unknowns of the future. And the third thing, so we're, we are growing faster, we're large but unique. But the third thing, and this is why it, I'm so happy, I want to congratulate you for being here today, is that our task is to create the new infrastructure that can make this unparalleled, unknown future happen. And the way it begins is by meeting each other by knowing each other, by knowing what we are doing, because we don't have the, uh, the local media, in media in every which way, which informs us as to what's happening. And we are still back in terms of basic human communication, and that's not an altogether bad thing. Culture, literature, poetry, is human energy. Humans develop their energy, their energy grows when they interact and they meet. You'll see again and again in the history of the arts, a new artistic movement doesn't happen for one person doing it. It's when two or three people get together, they begin talking, they begin to understand how much they share, and they gain confidence, they gain expertise, uh, they gain wisdom from being around one another. Uh, that's what's gonna happen today, and so I, Welcome you all together into our messy, glorious, and dreamy future. So nice to meet you.